the last five <laughs> years, um, the film Jeremy version Jordan and did filmed a it. film version of the we play. The album. And I guess when you just said, think of it more as a film experience, how did you guys, have, have you all seen the last five years, the movie? <laughs> um, well done. Thank you. you. Uh, so I wanted to, and that, the cast album is fantastic, and so I wanted to know, can you talk a little bit about the, that project and, and how it came to be and how you handled all the music for that movie? Yeah, well, um, my partner on it was Richard Legravenes, and, um, and Richard Legravenes adapted it and directed it. Um, and our engineer was um, Lawrence Manchester, um, who is incredible. And Richard's vision for it was to try to capture as much live, live um, on the set. So, so I mean, if you think about it, everybody probably saw the Les Mis film. Um, the Les Mis film was different in that they had a piano on the set, and they allowed the actors to kind of dictate the tempo. <coughs> and, um, and so when you watch the film, there's, no, there's not real kind of tempo. It's all kind of all over the place. And so the orchestra had to, um, it took them a really long time to bring the orchestra in and, and, and match what the actors were doing. So for the last five years, we did it a little bit differently in that we recorded the basic tracks um, with the actors singing, um, with uh, a band of six or seven, um, and the things, and, and basically what we did was, we had the, um, and we recorded it with three different microphones. We recorded it with um, a kind of a live, <laughs> and we recorded it with a boom mic, and we recorded it with a studio mic, so that we had the ability to go back and forth between cuts and edits and everything. Um, and the, all the, the actors had um, earpieces in so that when they were doing, let's just say, um, uh, I'm still hurting, um, you would hear, she would hear the, the playback in her ear, um, so it was already done, so we weren't dictating the tempo. Um, she wasn't dictating the tempo, she was following along with the playback in her ear and singing it live. Um, and then we were able, because we were able to record with those three different mics, um, we were able to capture, I, I would say, 80% was live <laughs> on, on, the, on the set. And um, the stuff that we couldn't capture, like for example, moving too fast when he's walking through the city or he's on a boat or those kinds of things were not, were not live. But for the most part, um, it was live and, and it was, it was and, then we, and then after it was done, we sweetened, when I say sweetened, we added a lot more strings, we added, um, we added a lot of the orchestration to it. But that's kind of how we, we made that. So when that, he's doing you know, that huge shmuel number? That's all live. That's all live, but a cappella? No, he's got, he's got. No, but I mean, there's no, there were no musicians around for him, it's all in his no, ear. No, we were in a stu we were in a studio, I mean, we were in a, a brownstone up in Harlem, and, um, I mean, there was, there was a time when we had a piano, like, when things are really out of tempo, um, or, or they don't have, like, for example, um, I think, if I didn't believe in you, that was, um, because it is just the kind of piano, I think, at the beginning of that, or guitar, maybe. We did have a piano, a synthesizer, so he was able to kind of do that, but for the most part, it was, uh, it was done live, hearing in a, in, a, in, a, in there, just a little earpiece in their ears. It's incredible. I want to ask, so Kurt, when I first met Kurt, he was a, a phenomenal actor and, and starred in many musicals. I remember Faust being a huge thing in your career. So obviously you had experience as a performer in musical, and as you said earlier, you did do Snoopy at some point, mm -hmm. and that's really one to learn on. Um, how did you figure out that you had this extraordinary calling, aside from being a performer in your life, to produce the cast recordings we love so much? I, I never really thought that I was going to... What I, what I, I was in college for acting and directing, but I always acted in the summertime. And I grew up in St. Louis and went to the Muni every, um, 
you know, every week because my mom had season tickets, so I saw musicals. Um, I, uh, I thought that when my hair would fall out that I would produce. I didn't know that I would, you know, produce theater um, or direct. How did you know your hair was going to fall out? <laughs> my, my mom's dad was bald, so I thought, you know, it's like, but, um, so, so anyway, but, but, but basically what happened was um, in 19, in, in, in about 1999, um, Sherry, who um, was my wife, got um, Aida, and um, somebody gave her a record contract, and I, and I looked at it, and I thought it was kind of a ridiculous contract, and I said, you're playing to, you know, uh, 15,000 people a week on Broadway, and at that time, it was um, very, uh, the Amazon had just started, internet was just, you know, it was like a very different time. And, um, and so uh, we had this idea to do a solo record, um, and there really weren't major labels interested in Broadway performers doing their own thing. So, so we had this idea to start this record label um, for our friends, and, and it was more about, and it was kind of post-rent, so a lot of the people, Adam Pascal, and, it was, and Tommy, it was, really, it was really Rent and Tommy were the catalysts for those, for us for wanting to kind of artists. create that community. And so what we wanted to do is to kind of create a United Artists for Broadway um, was kind of the goal. And then um, with the last five years, um, the original last five years that was right after 9-11, um, I, I, I had started getting into this probably a couple of years later, and I said, and I realized that that same contract that they gave to uh, to uh, to artists was the same contract they gave to show, <coughs> they gave to shows. And I thought, why would a Broadway producer, an off-Broadway producer, give away their rights and hardly ever make any money off of that thing? So I said, you know, what if I partnered with the producers of the show and we made the record together? And at this point, I had distribution and and I could you know, produce the record, um, make it happen, and get it out there, and we all are kind of partners together. So the extension of kind of United Artists for Broadway was also United Artists for Cast Albums. And that's kind of how it all started. How I, I, I just always, I, I love music. So, so, um, and I love musicals. And so I, I, I'm not an engineer. What I, where I come from it, from is a place of, um, of direction, like as a director. So I would, I, I, I work from wanting to get the truth out of the performance and the soul out of the performance. And so, so that's kind of where I, where I come from. But that's, that's just kind of how I see it. So when Kurt talks about being the director, as it were, of the recording aspect of the show, when you recorded Head Over Heels, uh, Michael Mayer was the director of the show, um, who I'll see tonight, the Charlie yeah. Brown reunion. Um, who directed your recording session? Was there a Kurt? Was there someone sort of? Tom. Um, Tom was there, yeah. Tom's, and, uh, Tom Kitt. Okay. And our, because he was the musical director? He was our musical supervisor, okay. yeah. So he had done all of the vocal arrangements and the orchestrations, and he was there. Our engineer, Scott, I don't know Scott's last name. Scott Bryce. Uh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Thanks, so the two of them were in the booth, and so I couldn't see them, you know, but they would come over and talk and give notes on something or, or, or talk it out. Um, and then Michael Mayer did come later. He wasn't there for the whole session, um, but he was there for um, a lot of it. A lot of, time, a lot of times directors... It's, it's interesting. A lot of times directors will or won't show up. A lot of times you'll be working with the composer um, um, who, who uh, you know, presents his, his music. Yeah. And a lot of times I would say the orchestrator and the music supervisor are, are really, yeah. and it really depends on 
you know, and you really have to have a chain of command of, yes. of how you want it, because you don't want all these people giving notes. Yes, and Tom was definitely like the voice of being yeah. in charge, and then they would be like, okay, hold on, and then we'd stop hearing what they would be discussing, thank God, and then they'd come back and be like, oh, okay, Bonnie, we're going to take that again, you're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not because it wasn't good, right? Just because right. it, it was the drum who was having a problem? Well, right. it was just that first number, honestly, just learning, like it was a, a brand new, Again, it wasn't my, my first rodeo, but it was in many other ways. Um, and Charlotte Caffey of the Go-Go's was there. What's funny is um, about the, the Go-Go's, they're so excited. They were so excited about us doing the piece and putting our spin on it that they were just like, it's great. Like, <laughs> there wasn't like, any like, well, it was just like, wow, we don't sing like that. That's great. You know, you're like, okay. So it was really cool to have um, Charlotte there just like so happy whenever we would like finish a song, I would go out on the break and she'd be there and a couple of the producers of um, Head of Her Heels were there. Um, again, not talking during, but there and listening and I'm sure speaking when they would turn the, the mic off for us. Um, but it was just this like, yay, we're doing this. It's an incredible thing, right? It's also yeah. such a celebration. Well, we almost didn't get one too. You know, we were still looking for ticket sales and we were, um, we were trying to get our audience and everybody believed in the piece and believed in the show so much that they're like, we need an album and we want this out there. And we don't know how long we'll be here, but this is something important. And one of our producers were essentially like self-producing the album to make sure that it was done which I'm so grateful for. I wanted to ask you about this, Kurt, because there, there are, is more than one company, not that many, that produce cast recordings. Obviously, you're king, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but, but the number of, of cast recordings in your catalog is huge, um, not to mention Patti LuPone solo albums. Like, it's a really casual. extraordinary thing, yes. Um, <laughs> Casual, casual. Uh, casual Patty, as we call her. Uh, Pat, she's incredible. But um, we were listening to we were li listening to, to the um, company record. I just got in the mix of. Kurt the and I were listening to it. Yeah. So we just recorded it, and um, and I just got it last week, and we were we were um, listening to Ladies Who Murder version oh. of Ladies Who Lunch, and it's gonna it's gonna blow people away. Kurt and I were like, I wish there was like a camera filming us listening to it because we were out of our minds and Kurt, Kurt's offices are by the way beautiful and kind of super mad many like sexy but big I, bar, yes, wow, yes. <laughs> coffee <laughs> bar but I guess they just have to understand at Warner Chapel that like on his floor cast recordings will be blaring yeah. and I walk out of the elevator and like everyone's sort of trying to do their work and then Kurt's just in this room that's like the coolest room ever and literally like at the I can't even, I don't know math, but whatever the decimal was. 11. 11. 11. It was not 11. It would have been like my mom would have said, turn it down. And I thought, like, if I died right now, and I don't want to, but the last thing I'm hearing is Patty LuPone, like, in the most perfectly pitched, gorgeous, clean vocal singing, Everybody Rise. Like that, if I had to go with Kurt, with my old friend Kurt. Um, it was amazing. But I guess what I wanted to ask you is how, you know, when she was saying there was no one to do Head Over Heels and then the producer hero gallops in on his or her white horse, how do you decide, A, which ones you're going to produce and is there like a bidding war? Like how does it work? Well, I, I, it just depends on it. It's, it really depends on the show, um, and you know we had industry day yesterday. We were talking about you know a very similar similar thing. It's like I'm not. No, this was the only person ever to ask you this no, question. No, 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 we didn't really talk about that. We talked about we talked about um, you know I I I'm, I have a, I feel a huge responsibility um, about preserving as much as I possibly can, but I'm not a not for profit. And um, and so I have to look at the commercial viability of something. Um, I also have to look at uh, if it's if it, you know because I want to preserve. I mean, I, I, I want to preserve from Michael John to you know the Be More Chill to I want to support all of these composers, these young composers, and I also see the value of preserving uh, the Brigadoon or the Mr. Rosewater or 
all, all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, um, the people who are producing the shows, if they're raising money for, um, for if they're raising $12 million or $15 million, however much it costs to do a Broadway show, they need to put in their budget a portion, if not all of the recording budget, in there because um, because it, this in this day and age with streaming and how expensive these records are, I mean these records can cost somewhere between four hundred and two hundred to four hundred to more thousand dollars to produce. To produce. Um, you know, when all the unions and the everything kind of come 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 in. And so and so I think and, and with streaming now it, it, it's um, the amount of money that you get from from the sale of the record doesn't necessarily make up. So very few of these records actually recoup their costs. Um, so I really look at, um, I really look to the producers. Um, I will sometimes partner with them. I, I mean, I most of the times partner with the producers for the most part, but, but at the end of the day, um, a lot of the shows, um, whether it's at the public or you know, we just did 100 Days and Miss You Like Hell and, uh, and a lot of these shows that I love dearly, that whose performances and the composers, you know, for their study and everything, that we, that we need these recordings for licensing purposes. But um, but I really think that if it's possible to um, have the, the the cost in their budget, so that it's so that we're not having to worry about, yeah. you know, worry about oh my gosh, Head Over Heels is not going to be recorded, um, and then I serve as kind of like a producer. But um, but I. I gravitate towards things that are original um, or um, that are new. Um, I don't do as many um, revivals. I do do, I have done revivals, but I don't do as many unless I feel like it's something different. Um, there's something unique or different about it. Um, uh, and, um, and, and or, or, or I'm working with producers that I have long histories with or composers that I have long histories with or performers that I have long histories with. So. Melissa Erico, who has a solo album called Sondheim Sublime, I did a bunch of panels with her yesterday, and you produced that recording for her, one of the solo artists that we worked with, um, had CDs with her, and, and gave me one, and I was so excited, and then I really thought about it, and I thought, do I have a CD player <laughs> in, other than in my car? And I was like, here I have like, and I, and I was like, please sign it for me. And it was thrilling because I just think she has one of the most gorgeous voices. And I think, by the way, it's an incredible album. It's really beautiful and really like, I'm a Sondheim lover and she delivered, you know, my dream if I could sing a Sondheim album, I would love to sound like her on hers. But what is happening now? I mean. I see people come to stage doors with their CDs to have people sign them, but who is who is actually listening still? Vinyl is cool now, like the Neil Chill vinyl album is super cool, and, and that feels relevant right now. But what happens to CDs, and why are we still making them? Well, I, I don't mean to, I'm, I'm being honest. Like, if, if everyone has AirPods now, I don't want them to go away, but what happens? We, um, we make CDs for people who collect. We make CDs for people who, you know, and, and it's also generational. You know, I think a show like Beautiful or, or, or um, actually the Sondheim Sublime album, surprisingly, is selling a lot of physical. So I think that, I think that a show like Be More Chill, not a lot of physical, <laughs> mostly streaming. Um, or, or, the, or we create a collector's item kind of piece. So we did the vinyl that people could collect, cherish. cherish yeah. You know, so, so and the same thing with Book of Mormon. We, you know, we, we did uh, a vinyl version where it's like uh, my idea was to do like two golden plates. So it's like, I got the golden plates. You know, so it's like two gold records. Or, or um, we did a vinyl of Drowsy Chaperone, which was. You know, my, the thought was, okay, what would the actual record be that Bob Martin listens to? <laughs> and the funny thing about that is, is that we sell that vinyl to the, our biggest consumer. Of that vinyl is prop masters for the people who are actually doing the show, you know, in Summerstock or wherever. So, like, we want to get that vinyl version. So, um, you know, so it's like. 
but I still think streaming, I mean, streaming is where, where everything is right now. And, and, and I think it gives people the control to make playlists, to create their own things, you know, and, um, and we don't really focus on single songs as cast albums. It becomes a listening experience. The whole thing is a story, so people are not really just wanting to listen to one song. They're wanting to have that experience. So that's, uh, you know, I don't know where it's going to go from here, but I think that it's going to, CDs will be going away. <laughs> what was the first cast recording you remember like saving up for or someone giving to you? Wow. Uh, I had several that I remember being so in love with. I'm not quite sure what was my first. I'm Thoroughly Modern Millie was one that I just yeah. Yeah. was like, ugh, because you know, I grew up in the Midwest and we had like huh? a one light town, you know, and where the light is always red. Exactly. That Charlie Brown was a big favorite of mine. Um, last five years I remember finding that. My teacher told me about it and I was like, what is this? Um, yeah, and then you you escaped into these albums, you know, I, I grew up in a double wide trailer in um, central Illinois and um, you could get the booklet and you could read through and so much of the story was in there and um, and I remember sometimes going to like Barnes and Noble and you could go and put like the headphones on and find an album if it couldn't afford it and you could just listen to it right there. Um, yeah, so I had lots of, yeah, those were like my favorite. I loved Wonderful Town, I loved, yeah. Can you tell us, so obviously the Elaine, the, the video that went viral, which is sort of the beginning in the Broadway community of something, it's sort of like Michael in the bathroom, which is Elaine Stritch singing. Ladies Who Lunch, if you haven't seen it, I've heard Broadway comments, like saying, does anyone, <laughs> like what a stupid rhetorical question. Um, do you have anything like that in your experience um, that, not, not that would embarrass anybody, right. but something hilarious that happened in a recording studio, or really um, compelling that you were able to work through miraculously for the time that we listened to the album, but anything that you can remember that's kind of... I mean, there's, every, every album has a story. I think that um, the most one of the most challenging records that we did was the um, revival of the hair recording, um, which is a—I mean, God, you know, God rest a Gulp McDermott hero. I mean, cause we talk about albums for me when I was a kid. Hair was hair was, you know, up there. But um, we—it was one of the first records we, we we did where because the cast is in almost every um, every song. And so um, we had to set up the studio in such a way 